You know, there are many doors all around the world that have no keys. Maybe you can guess how to open them. The first destination is... Okay, read this, and good luck to you. It's a temple in India. The temple's name comes from this other really long word, which can be translated as the one emerging from the lotus. This temple is one of India's most popular and sacred places. It's one of 108 temples of this word. It dates way back. It was mentioned in Tamil literature in the 6th century. Flash forward to our time. In 2011, the Indian Supreme Court decided to document the valuables of the temple because they had been informed that the place might have been misused. To do so, they had to open the doors that had been closed for centuries. The committee went to the temple and discovered six huge secret vaults that held unbelievable treasures. After the chamber doors opened, they found at least $22 billion worth of golden idols, necklaces, and coins. The officials also discovered ceremonial costumes and gold coconut shells with jewels. Plus, they saw large diamonds. Not our understanding of large, though. Some of these precious stones were as large as 110 carats. To put it in perspective, a small solid gold statue from the collection could be worth around $30 million. After this fairy tale-ish treasure had been discovered, the temple got equipped with metal detectors, cameras, and other safety precautions before the first visitors started to arrive. Now, there are a lot of security guards at the temple. But are they protecting the treasure, or is there something more mysterious hiding behind its doors? The temple has six chambers, and the valuables are kept there. These rooms are named Chambers A through F. The expedition committee opened five of these vaults with significant effort. But the most bizarre thing is that, despite all the efforts involving existing tech, the mysterious Chamber B still wouldn't open. On the side of the door, two carved cobras are welcoming you. The door works as a gate. You can easily see it with the unaided eye, just like the doors leading to other chambers. Surprise! Experts discover two more doors behind the first one. The second door is wooden, and the last one is made of iron. Strangely, the last door was sealed. It also doesn't have any means of entry, no bolts, handles, latches, or anything else. To this day, no one knows what's inside Chamber B. Believers say that opening the door against its will can release into the world unnameable things. Others say that Chamber B may hide a tunnel. It might not be related to the reasons above, but the High Court of India warned against opening the doors of Chamber B. Now, in 2010, David Crespi, a French engineer, visited Machu Picchu. He discovered a strange door in one of the main buildings. The door was in a narrow path neither tourists nor archaeologists used very often. David believed that the place was an entrance the Incas had sealed for some reason. He contacted archaeologists and authorities right away. They promised him to start investigating the area in the near future and let him know about his potential discovery. Well, months passed, but he didn't get any news. No response to his emails and calls. In 2011, he found an article by Terry Jameen about Peru. David reached out to him in no time. He described his finding to Jameen. After that, Jameen and other archaeologists went to Machu Picchu to investigate the secret door. They concluded that this door was indeed an entrance sealed by the Incas. The researchers confirmed the existence of two entrances found behind the famous door. They also got the 3D representation of a staircase leading to the main room and another chamber. The analysis also revealed several cavities, among which there was a vast quadrangular room. Plus, geo-radars detected some metals. Those might be golden and silver objects. Jameen and his team thought this place was a chamber of pre-Hispanic times. They believed the door had been sealed by the Incas to hide something important. Maybe an enormous treasure, or something no less precious. Jameen also claimed that finding this chamber could lead to the discovery of a mausoleum. Jameen submitted an official request to the Peruvian authorities for permission to open the chambers. Yet, neither his application nor requests of other archaeologists have been approved so far. Authorities claim that opening this door could cause damage on the other sides of the archaeological site. 
Yet, the use of an endoscopic camera has confirmed the hypothesis that the stone blocks at the entrance are only there to close the passage. They are not there to support the internal structures of the building. No one expected such a strong storm. It's too dangerous to sail back to the land because of high waves and winds. But suddenly, you notice a small green island nearby. You and your friend are about 25 miles off the coast of Brazil. You were fishing and didn't notice black clouds obscuring the blue sky. You're approaching the unknown island and see a Coast Guard boat behind you. People from there are screaming something to you, but you can't make out the words because of the thunder. They tell us we should stay away from that island, your friend says. Despite the warning, you still sail since there's no other way out. Around the island, you notice sharp rocks sticking out of the water like knives in the dark. Now you realize what the Coast Guard warned about, but it's too late. Your boat hits a rock. The bottom is pierced. You start to sink. The rain and wind are getting stronger. Both of you fall overboard. Then darkness comes. You wake up in the morning because of the scorching sun and a dry mouth. Your friend and the wrecked boat are lying nearby. Apparently, you'll have to wait for rescuers to get out here. Now in the light of day, you can see how dangerous the island's coast is. It's surrounded by rocks, and you're lucky you've survived. Getting out of here will be difficult. Together with your companion, you decide to look for coconuts and bananas. Your friend goes to the wreckage and pulls out a bag of medicine. Then, both of you leave the sandy beach and enter the dense jungle. A couple of steps later, you hear a strange hiss. You see your friend. His eyes are filled with horror. Goosebumps run down your back. You feel something alive crawling under your feet, and there's a lot of it. You look down and notice slithering snakes. There are dozens of them. They wrap around your legs, get into trees. They're everywhere. Don't move, your friend says. I think I know where we are. You want to ask him a question, but fear takes away your voice. He reads your face and answers the question. We're in one of the most dangerous places on Earth, the Brazilian Snake Island. These are not just some ordinary snakes. This is the Golden Lancehead, one of the most venomous reptiles in the world. You can find them nowhere else on the planet except for this land. They evolved here naturally, without other snake species intervention. That made their venom five times stronger than the venom of ordinary vipers. They're practically the only owners of this island. Nowhere else in the world will you find such a concentration of creeping reptiles on such a small piece of land. And now, they're glad that two big lunch meals have arrived. There's little chance of survival, but you're gonna try. The first thing you need to do is get out of your stupor and find a thick stick. This is your best tool right now. If you encounter a venomous snake, the best you can do is retreat slowly. But this time, there are too many of them. They're aggressive and hungry. Together with your friend, you fight off the snakes with a stick. But there's more and more of them coming. One of them falls on your shoulder from a tree and bites your neck. The poison instantly enters your bloodstream and affects your muscles. It feels like your body is melting. It becomes difficult to move and your neck swells. Your friend grabs you and carries you deep into the jungle. Here, among the trees, you notice an old lighthouse. Yeah, this building really stands out here. Once a year, the Coast Guard visits it. Your friend breaks down the door and puts you on the floor. You're afraid you won't be able to survive the bite. Fortunately, your friend is a doctor. He injects the necessary medicine and saves your life. You have a few minutes to rest before more danger arises. Your friend tells you that the unique snakes appeared here thousands of years ago. This island was part of Brazil for a long time. Then, massive floods separated it from the continent. This part of the land was cut off from the whole world, which helped the formation of a unique ecosystem inside. Vipers that lived here evolved into golden lanceheads. They quickly became the main masters of the island and destroyed all the other animals. But how did they manage to survive without food? cut off from the whole world. They did it thanks to nature and evolution. This island is a transit point for many birds. They stop here to rest during long flights. These birds become dinner for the snakes. 
Previously, a snake bite almost didn't harm the birds. They were frightened and flew away, leaving the snake without food. But over years of evolution, the island's owners have developed such a potent poison that one bite was enough for a bird to never take off again. There's also a legend that a pirate hid treasures here a long time ago. And so that no one would ever find it, he brought snakes to guard his gold. Of course, there's no chest with coins here, but the island is attractive for modern pirates, even today. Golden lancehead snakes are an expensive commodity, so bad people often visit this place to hunt the reptiles. That's why the Coast Guard is always on duty around the island. People are forbidden to visit this place. And even if someone manages to get past the guards, they will have to face the rocks. Only biologists and scientists have permission to study the local fauna. Uh, now the first rule is not to panic, the guy says. He gives Michael a thick suit. The weather is hot here, and the outfit seems very warm. You can't go without it, he adds. Michael puts on the outfit and feels goosebumps all over his body. Why is it so cold? The guide explains this is a unique cooling cloth. It'll save Michael from heat stroke inside the cave. The guide gives him an oxygen tank and a mask. Are we gonna dive? Michael asks. No, but your lungs may fill up with water if you don't use it. Michael's knees are shaking with fear. He doubts this whole idea. Welcome to one of the most dangerous caves on the planet, the guy says as he enters the dark space at the foot of a mountain. This place is called Crystal Cave, and it's located in Mexico. Magma had leaked here from the hot bowels of our planet 26 million years ago. It was coming and cooling down again and again. There was so much magma that it formed a mountain. Along with magma, mineral-rich water got here. It had been seeping through the rock tunnels and had formed a cave under the hill. Then, something strange appeared in these hot waters. Something that seems to be from another planet. Michael is going down the rope. He illuminates the bottomless darkness with a flashlight. The air becomes hot and heavy. Microscopic particles of water are hovering here. Along with a guide, Michael descends to 980 feet. This is more than half of the Empire State Building's height. The air temperature goes up. It feels as if they were approaching the Earth's core. Finally, the descent ends, and they jump on solid ground. The guy puts on an oxygen mask and tells Michael to do the same. He can't breathe in such moist and acidic air. The lungs can fill with water, which will lead to disastrous consequences. The air here feels to Michael as if he's walking through a very thick fog. The temperature rises up to 136 degrees Fahrenheit. It's higher than in the world's most hot deserts. Michael lights his way and notices something big, white, and shiny. It's a huge crystal beam sticking out of the ground that's reaching up. The whole cave is filled with these huge things. They stretch in different directions and rest against the ceiling and the walls. Somewhere they block the path, and somewhere they are like bridges. Michael climbs onto one of the crystals and walks on it. The guide explains that each column is made of gypsum. You know this substance as it's used to produce building material, plasterboard. Michael touches the hard surface of one of them. It seems that some ancient civilization could have built it. The guide says that everything inside this cave is natural. For the first time, this place was discovered by two miners in the year 2000. Since then, scientists have managed to find out that some crystals are 500,000 years old. You can also find one of the largest natural crystals in the world here. This beam is about 36 feet long and weighs 55 tons. This place is filled with water rich in calcium sulfate. This element is capable of forming minerals. A colorless variety of gypsum prevails here. The water and warm air help form the crystals. Humidity and temperature haven't changed for centuries, so these columns continue to grow even now. This place is fascinating. Michael wants to stay here longer to explore the cave, but unfortunately, it's dangerous. They may get lost or slip on the gypsum rocks. Plus, they're running out of oxygen, so they have to climb back up. They come out of the cave and meet the police. It turns out that it's prohibited for tourists to enter the cave. Even scientists must get special permission to go here. And it's for a good reason, since the cave is one of the most dangerous places on Earth. 
Michael and the guy pay a fine and leave Mexico. The next stop is Italy. It's a good thing you've taken a good camera with you, the guide says. This is one of the most fascinating caves in the world. You need the best equipment to capture this beauty. Michael and the guide are on a small boat. They sail along the coast of the island of Capri, Italy. Luckily, there won't be any danger this time. They are approaching a small rift inside the mountain. This is the entrance to the Blue Grotto. The hole is so tiny that only one boat can pass through it. Michael and the guide get into another dimension. The cave is filled with water. The walls are shining with blue light coming from the lake's depths. Michael takes pictures of the cave and notices that the entrance they got through glows with a bright white light. It's the sun's rays illuminating the cave as they enter it. There's another hole under the water. The sunlight penetrates through it, filling the lake with a blue glow. But it's time to move on. The next cave is in New Zealand. They arrive to the North Island. There's a place deep underground with winding, intricate caves. They appeared here about 30 billion years ago. Michael and the guide approach the entrance to the dark cave. Michael turns on a flashlight. Take it away, the guy says. You won't need it inside. They come in. Michael opens his mouth in surprise. The whole cave is filled with glowing lanterns. They are all living creatures, fireflies. They're shining with a blue light. Michael feels like he's on another planet. The entrance to the cave is limited to not harm the fireflies. Scientists use automated equipment to monitor the cave. They watch the temperature and the level of carbon dioxide necessary to maintain the life of glowing beetles. If many people get here, the level of carbon dioxide will increase. The time for a visit is also limited, so they ask Michael and the guide to leave the place. Let's check out one interesting town surrounded by mountains and woods in upstate New York. This place sits right on a big lake, and the city is called Lake George. People like to come here to go fishing, boating, and take up other water activities. You can meet many fishers, athletes, and a screaming man standing by the shore. Lake George is one of the most popular places in the northern part. Wait a minute, what? A screaming man? What does it mean? Yeah, people come to the shore, look towards the lake and the mountains, and just scream loudly. It looks pretty weird from the outside. Here's a young guy screaming, then he leaves, and a girl stands in his place. She starts screaming too, and then she offers you to do the same. Okay, you come to the spot where she was standing, turn towards the water, and shout. Wow! The sound of your voice echoes back to you. You hear yourself as if the sound wave passed through a giant megaphone. Your scream sounds distorted. It's unbelievable. You get closer to the shore and start screaming again. But this time, the magic is gone. You hear your usual scream. You return to that point and here's the sound of your cry rising to you again with an echo. But how does this happen? Look where you're standing, the girl tells you. You're standing on a round concrete platform with an engraved image of a compass. Right on the compass, you see a blue map of the lake. In the center of this pattern, two compass lines intersect and form the X symbol. Anyone who stays in this exact spot and shouts towards the lake will hear an incredible echo of their voice. It's as if your scream is coming back to you from another dimension. But the most exciting thing is that people standing nearby don't hear it. They see you as just a screaming person with an ordinary voice. They can hear the echo only in this X spot. Scientists still can't explain this acoustic phenomenon or figure out the reason for this behavior of the sound waves. All they have is guesses and theories. The concrete platform is surrounded by a small curved wall from the lakeside. Some people think that your voice resonates from this wall and creates this sound effect. Many places have similar semicircular walls, but they can't play such an acoustics trick. Another theory says that mountains and water somehow create the echo effect. There's also an old legend according to which a magical creature appeared at this spot. It shouted towards the water, and its wisdom has echoed throughout the lake ever since. I still think the sound resonates from the wall, but let's move on. We have more places to go. 
The next incredible location we're going to drop by is in California. Welcome to Lake Berryessa. Just stand on the shore and watch. Everything seems normal. Beautiful nature, clean, calm water. But there's a huge deep hole in this lake into which millions of cubic feet of water are pouring per second. But don't worry. This is not a natural anomaly or a tunnel to the underworld. It's the glory hole, and people created it. Lake Berryessa is in the area where the farming town of Monticello used to stand. In the last century, people built a dam next to the lake. During the rains, the water level rose and overflowed beyond the edges of the dam. To solve this problem, engineers built a vast hole. To give you an idea of how vast it is, imagine an ant standing on the edge of your bathtub with water flowing through the drain hole. The glory hole is as big for you as the drain hole would be for the ant. The water goes through a long horizontal tunnel and enters the nearest bay. The glory hole is a local attraction and a popular place for tourists. Now let's move to the Caribbean region for another fascinating location. Here, among the clear blue sea, you can find a unique lake on one of the dreamlike islands. Its entire territory looks like a giant concrete platform. But don't swim in it. Steam emanates from the lake's surface because of high temperatures. Almost all the water here is liquid asphalt. Hitch Lake is the largest asphalt deposit in the world. Its depth is 250 feet, which means that a passenger Boeing can fit there in an upright position. Scientists haven't yet studied the lake thoroughly. They think there's a fault in the Earth's crust underneath it. Natural gases and oil pass through this crack and mix with water. Then, all this liquid goes through many chemical reactions and turns into asphalt. The lake contains about 10 million tons of hot material, according to rough estimates. Theoretically, no life can exist in such conditions, but scientists discovered a colony of microbes there. This means that life outside of our planet can exist. Saturn's largest moon, Titan, has many hydrocarbon lakes on its surface, similar to Pitch Lake. And if the simplest forms of life can exist here, in the asphalt lake, they may also survive on Titan. Our next unusual lake is in a pretty unexpected place, in the driest region on Earth. And these are not hot dunes and lifeless plains. This region is in Antarctica. A dry area is not where it's hot, but where there's almost no precipitation. The desert is not heat and sand, but the absence of life. Some areas of Antarctica meet these two criteria. It's so cold here that a mug of tea can freeze in a minute. But the lake we want to see doesn't freeze. Although it's not even a lake, but a pond, because of its tiny size and depth of several inches. It resembles a large puddle of icy water. It doesn't freeze because Don Juan Pond is one of the saltiest reservoirs on the planet. Salt prevents water from turning into ice. But the most interesting thing is the lake's origin. Scientists still don't know how it appeared here. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.